So here we are on the Paul Smith College campus, and uh, we're going to start looking at cone-bearing trees today, or conifers. The typical one you might think of would be pine trees. Um, and you've probably heard of pine cones and pine needles and things like that. Those would be conifers or cone-bearing trees. But there are actually many kinds around here and they're an important part of the ecology and also the human history in this area. So we want you to become familiar with several of these. You'll learn about how to identify them, uh, how their life cycle works, ways people use them, some things about their ecology so that while you're walking to and from classes or just living in this area or frankly anywhere that has conifers, you'll know something more about what you're looking at. So uh, one of the themes in these field-oriented labs is to make the point that there's more diversity out here in the woods or in the natural world than you might think. So here we are, we've got this sort of a edge of the lawn, beginning of the forest, a lot of greenery around here. Um, there's actually a big old pine right there. That's a, a white pine. We'll learn more about that in a minute. But there are lots of other trees in here that are also green with needles. And if you came back in the winter, they would still be green, not having dropped their leaves like maples and other trees do. So we call them evergreens for that reason. Right here, there are several kinds of evergreen which are not pines, but they still have needles. They still make cones. One of the kinds that's maybe the most different from pine trees would be this kind right here. with The sort of stringy looking bark right here. These kinds of, of conifers usually live in wet areas. There can be entire swamps full of them. This is a white cedar. And if you look at the greenery on here, it's not individual little needles like you'd think of with a pine tree, and yet it's still a conifer, it's still evergreen. These are flat and scaly. You might call these composite needles right here, like that. We're gonna ask you to learn this. Uh, also show you that they do make cones. These are the little woody cones of white cedars. So we're gonna ask you to be able to identify something like this if we showed you the needles and, uh, or if we're outside and maybe uh, point to it or something like that. So we have a lab handout that you'll be going through and um, the beginning of this sort of gives you some tips on what to look for. So if you see these flat composite needles, you'll call that a white cedar. The genus name is Thuja or Thuya, however you wanna pronounce it but right next to it is another kind of conifer. These do have little green needles on them. They do make cones, but they're very, very small. I'll pick some off the ground for you. This one is called hemlock. Now that's the kind of the regular English name for them. Um, one of the cool things about learning about these is learning the scientific names as well. Um, this one is Suga, T-S-U-G-A. The reason it's important to remember that as well as the regular name hemlock is because there's an herb called hemlock, which is deadly poisonous. So you can actually make a tea out of this, just boil some water and stick the needles in and then you can sweeten it and drink it. You wouldn't want to do that with poison hemlock. So um, these are hemlock trees, short needles. They're lighter on the underside. They have little twigs that branch off and they're all covered with these little needles. And if we look super close, the needles have these little tags on them that attach them to the twig. Little petioles like that, you call them. So um, that's hemlock or suga. People have used this tree right here, this kind of tree, for a source of chemicals that you can use for tanning leather. It's called tannin, oddly enough. And uh, these chemicals that are in here are not there so people can tan leather. It's there to protect the tree. If some kind of a critter chews on the bark or the twigs, the tannins go into the animal's body and basically can destroy proteins. It sort of links them up 
So if there were a critter grazing on this, thinking they're gonna get a nice nutritious meal, it can actually destroy the nutritional value of the meal. And in theory, either sicken the animal or make them starve to death. So over the ages, some animals have adapted, but um, that's the scientific explanation for why there are bitter tannins in here and uh, why you can also use it then to treat leather because that's what you're doing, taking the protein of the leather and preserving it with these chemicals. So hemlock trees were a big industry in the 1800s, especially in the Adirondacks. People harvested them largely for the bark for the tanning industry. So we've got another kind of a conifer here that looks a lot like hemlocks when you look up close and I'll show you over here. Here in the same patch of woods, here's another one with little short needles. This one though has slightly longer needles than the hemlocks. This one is balsam fir, that's hemlock. So they look similar in some ways, but if you look really carefully, there's some pretty important differences that can help you identify them. So here you got little short needles. Well, these are kind of short, but they're maybe twice as long. Another difference is how the twig branches. If you look at this, the twigs come off pretty much parallel to each other. On the hemlock, they alternate going off like that. So that's a pretty good way to tell. If you get up close and take a whiff, you can smell it's kind of like a Christmas tree, which of course it is. This is what people use for Christmas boughs, Christmas trees, things like that around the holidays. So uh, balsam fir, it's F-I-R fir, not animal fir, that would be F-U-R. And uh, these can be aged. If you want to tell how old your branch is, it's kind of a neat little deal. If you notice how bright green these little tips are, these are this past spring and summer's growth so far. And these are older ones. Um, and so if you count the branch points, you can count how many years this branch has been growing. So here's this year's growth. There's last year, last year before that, the year before that. So there's one, two, three, four years of growth worth on here. If you get up close to a balsam fir tree, you get to practice this concept where going to be trying to learn, which is calling parts of trees what they are correctly. So there are fluids in the trunk here. There's sap that goes up, it brings water and minerals up from the soil and feeds the needles. Sap can also send sugars down from the needles down to the roots and keep it alive. But there's another fluid in here that a lot of times we call sap, but is actually another thing. It's a defense. And you can see this white crusty stuff on here. It's kind of gluey. If you sniff it, it smells really strongly of balsam fir. It's called resin, which is a defense, whereas um, the sap is more like nutrition and fluids, kind of like the blood in our own bodies. And on balsam fir, there are blisters of it, entire blisters of it that you can actually kind of cut open and watch that liquid come out. That's basically a glue right there. So very smelly. If an insect happened to chew into that, they'd get their mouth parts all glued up. It's also got tannins and a bunch of other actually terpenes. They're poisonous in there too. So uh, what we think of as the nice smell of balsam fir and Christmas trees, you could also describe as a sort of poison gas that would repel insects and other critters from eating it. So in the very old days, um, pioneers, trappers, Native Americans, used to collect this stuff and make glue out of it. So if you had a birch bark canoe, you could seal the seams in there. Birch bark containers, you could seal them up and then cook in them or hold water and things like that. So there were a lot of uses of this pitch or resin from balsam firs and uh, also from spruce trees, which we'll also see. Here's another conifer in the same grove of trees right here on the campus. This has short needles, but they're very, very prickly. And um, they're sort of all around the whole twig here like this, instead of splaying out flat like a balsam fir does where they're mostly just sticking out from one side or another. These are kind of sticking out all around. It's almost like a porcupine or a hedgehog or something. So if it's got these very sharp needly like needles, that would be a spruce. We've got black spruce and red spruce species around here. 
um, but that'll be a good way to tell this. Um, there's a lot of resin or pitch in the trunks of these as well, and uh, people used to use spruce pitch also for birch bark canoe sealant and stuff. Sometimes they're big globs of it dried on the trunk of the tree. If you break them off and start chewing them, it tastes terrible. But if you leave it in there and spit out the bitter, bitter terpenes and tannins and things, after a while you can chew it and it's like chewing gum. And it lasts forever, longer than regular chewing gum. So it's called spruce gum. And people used that in the old days as well. Here in among all of these kinds of conifer, from a white cedar to a balsam fir, a spruce, a hemlock, we have a little baby white pine just trying to start its life right here. If it survives, it could grow up as big as that adult over there. We've got a big old trunk over to the left um, that can be the tallest trees we've got around here on campus. But these have classic pine needles. They're long and floppy. They come in little bunches or fascicles. And uh, unless something has messed with this, you'll get five of these in every little clump. And that's characteristic of white pine. It's Pinus strobus. Strobus means like twisting and flickering and things like that, which these tend to do in the wind when you're watching it. So we're gonna ask you to learn Pinus strobus white pine, needles in groups of five. It's about the tallest trees around here. If we do a scan of the horizon here on the campus, those tallest, leafiest, fluffiest looking trees along the horizon line are big, tall, white pines. So that's pretty valuable lumber. People came up here in the 1800s harvesting them. Even before that, while we were still part of England, uh, the royalty of England used to reserve big, tall pines like that because they used them as ship masts and things like that. Um, so we're going to ask you to learn Pinus strobus. Balsam fir is abies or abies, however you want to pronounce it. We're mainly going to ask you to spell these, so be careful. Um, spruce is picea. These are kind of famous around in the Adirondacks, by the way, because spruce, especially red spruce, was used for making musical instruments, violins and guitars. So Adirondack spruce guitars were really well known until they were over harvested and there weren't so many. And then Adirondack spruce got famous again several decades ago when acid rain was more of a serious problem before we fixed it with Clean Air Act and things. It was killing the spruce trees around here. And it was the loss of red spruces that helped motivate people to fix the problem. So there's Picea. We have Thuja or Thuya the white cedar right here. And uh, we got Suga, the hemlock. And uh, there's one more kind of a pine we have to go somewhere else to see. So here we are in a grove of red pines right here on the Paul Smith's campus. Um, they're big and tall. They have big long needles. Um, and it's one of two common kinds of pine tree here in the campus. We've got white pine, which makes pine cones that look like this and has pretty long needles in clumps of five right here. And those are the biggest, tallest ones on the horizon. But we've got this other kind growing here that also makes pine cones, but they're smaller. But ironically, uh, even though their cones are smaller, their leaves are bigger. So over here, we can get close to one of them. Right here. Right next to some white pine saplings, we've got a red pine sapling. These needles are much longer. They're kind of more sparse. They're really kind of out on the ends of the branches like that. If you take off a little clump or fascicle, there are only two needles in every fascicle that way. So that's another way to tell. It's kind of easy once you get familiar with them to just sort of eyeball it and say, well, they're 
kind of spread out needles in clumps on the ends of the branches. They got red scaly bark, okay, red pine. Another way to tell them is where they're growing. They seem to do best where other kinds of tree don't do well. So on this steep sandy slope where the wind hits or out on the point sticking out in the lake where the wind comes in, it's thin sandy soil, that's where you're likely to find a whole grove of red pines here in the Adirondacks. So here's a little review of classifying these trees again. Um, this is a white pine, Pinus strobus. There's a red pine, Pinus resinosa. As you can guess, it's got a lot of resin in it and things like that. They both make cones, so you'd call them pine cones, but they look different depending on the species. The white pine cones are bigger. The red pine, pine cones are kind of small. There are other conifers we're learning. They also have cones, like here's a hemlock tree. Let me try to grab them better, get it closer. Those are little hemlock cones. So they're not pine cones, they're hemlock cones. Again, the reason these are being made is the cones are places where seeds are made. So once the cone is mature, these little scales here open up, or in this case here, they're opened up and little papery winged seeds can come dropping out. Here's what the white pine cone looks like when it's first forming. It's still green. It's got these scales that haven't opened up yet. It doesn't look like it's made of wood or anything. When this is mature and the little seeds are ready to let go, it's gonna look more like this and they'll open up and flop out like that. So here we are in a wetland here on the Paul Smith's campus. These are cattails that grow in marshes. So if you see cattails, you know it's a wetland. Um, if you see a certain kind of tree growing in a wetland, you, you can also call it a swamp. And one of the classic swamp trees around here is larches. Um, they go by lots of different names. The scientific name is Larix, which translates to larch. But uh, some people call them hackmatax or tamaracks or things like that too. And there's several of them growing here in this wet ground. They're conifers, they have cones. But even though they have needles as well, they're actually not evergreens, unlike the other cone-bearing trees we have here on campus. So they look kind of lacy and leafy. They've got cones on them. You can kind of see the little brown specks up on there. These are definitely needles. They're in clumps, just like white pine is or red pine, but you see how many, there's like tons of needles in these little clumps. They're on little pedestals like that. But maybe the most distinctive thing about these is they're not very shiny. They don't have a lot of wax on them. They're very soft, they're not very stiff. And uh, there's a good reason for that. These don't have to save as much water as your average white pine or red pine or balsam fir. Number one, they grow in a wet area where there's tons of water they can get with their roots, but they don't have to hang on to these all winter and risk them drying out. They drop them in the fall. So just like this alder tree here or the poplars or the birches, these are gonna turn color in the fall and drop every one of these needles and be barren. Just kind of funny, I mean, it, first of all, it's beautiful. There's like this gorgeous golden color in the fall. But when they lose the needles, a lot of folks who don't know the area think, oh, the poor tree's dying. Oh, it must be acid rain killing all of those poor trees. It's like, no, this happens every year. So these are conifers that are not evergreens. They have needles, but they drop them every year. Deciduous conifers. So here's one of our balsam fir trees we've been looking at. And uh, just wanna take a extra close look, an extra thoughtful look at this greenery right here. When you think of a green plant, you think, oh, something with leaves, you know, like uh, I don't know, the birch tree up there with all those birch leaves. And you say, well, the leaves are there to trap sunlight. The green color there is chlorophyll, which is a compound that traps sunlight, takes the energy of the sun,
and allows the tree to harvest that to make food. But to have the molecules to make the food, you also got to get those molecules, the raw materials like that, so that you can take the sun's energy and stick them all together and make sugar that will be in your sap. And then that can become wood, flowers, seeds, leaves, any of that other stuff. So the same thing's true here. You don't have the big, broad, flat leaves like a birch tree, but these are technically leaves also. It's just they're long and thin and you call them needles. So the green here is from a compound called chlorophyll. If you take biology 102, you'd learn about more of this kind of thing in the cells, how it works. But uh, basically, you trap the sunlight with this part on the underside, it's pale here. That's because there are these fine little white stripes. You'd need a hand lens or a microscope to see it up close. But in these little stripes are tiny little pinholes. They're breathing holes. So that's where the plant is sucking in air to get the molecules for the raw material to make the sugar with. Here's the green stuff trapping the sun's energy to run the machinery. The machinery is also being fed the raw materials from the air. And what they're basically breathing in is carbon dioxide. We exhale it, they inhale it. It's kind of a trade, actually. If I exhaled onto this like that, probably some of my carbon dioxide from my breath got sucked into that leaf. At the same time, the leaf, after it breathes in carbon dioxide, exhales. But what they exhale is oxygen. So it's kind of a neat trade. I get to inhale what they're exhaling and back and forth. Some of my carbons are now in that needle. So with the energy of the sunlight, the raw material of the carbon dioxide from the air, this is now able to make some sugars that are in this watery sap in the veins that can travel down the trunk, get stored in the bark, get stored in the roots, can be used to make new needles, used to make new wood, any of that kind of stuff. So the new growth that happens here in the spring from little buds that pop open in the spring and let that new growth happen are basically taking air molecules and water from the ground, sew it together with sunlight and make these little shoots out of that. And that's happening all over the tree. So it's basically growing from the tips of the branches outwards, sort of like crystallizing the air in a way like that. So um, a lot of folks might think, oh, a tree is getting pushed up from the ground and that's how it gets bigger. It's actually growing from the tips outwards and the trunk is putting on layers and layers and layers growing outwards as it goes. It's mostly air and water tied together with sunlight and uh, some minerals basically from the soil and you can turn it into a, a living tree like that. So there's an, one last little thing here to check out that has to do with these being evergreens. Most of the other trees here in the fall will drop their leaves, but the conifers keep them on. At least most of them do, which is why we call them evergreens. They're even green in the winter. Trouble with that is um, if you're a tree in the winter, the ground is frozen, so you can't suck water up to keep the internal stuff in here moist and doing what it does. So these are at risk of drying out, getting freezer burn in the winter, running out of moisture, and also if it's a hot day in summer too, they're at risk of drying out. So these needles are protected with wax that holds in the moisture, and the only way um, water could evaporate or escape from this at all is through those tiny little breathing holes, the stomata. And if necessary, they can close those off and save the, wa the water as well. So if you're going to be an evergreen, it helps to have shiny surfaces on here from a little layer of wax, almost like waxing your car or something like that, is protecting these needles from drying out too much from the drought of winter, especially. So here's a kind of a pine that's not native to here. These are called mugo pines. And here in the campus, they're an ornamental. But they illustrate the life cycle of pines really well, and conifers in general. So we'll use these as an example. You can see these 
next to some of the buildings here on campus. So um, it's definitely a pine. They have needles and things like that. Uh, if you look on the end here, you'd say, oh, looks like it's growing little pineapples or something. Well, those are brand new baby cones that haven't developed yet. So over time, those are going to get bigger and start looking more like this. So little purpley looking ones, now they're bigger and greener like that. Eventually, once the seeds in here are totally mature, it'll turn brown and woody and look like that and pop open and little papery seeds will come flying out. So if we were going to ask you what a pine cone looks like, you could say, well, here's a pine cone. You go pine. It could also look like that. It's just when it's younger. And technically, it looks like that, too. So just you basically would say this brown woody thing that we think of as pine cone is just mature, and it's already dropped its seeds out and things like that. But there's another kind of a cone on here that people might not notice at first. These come out... Oh, around June, something like that. Um, they last a month or so, and then they tend to crumble away and fall off. And it's this stuff right here. These actually count as cones, too. In the same tree, you get these. This makes seeds, so you call it a seed cone. This makes pollen. So around June, like I was saying, uh, late spring, early summer, Different pines, not just this, but a lot of the ones around here make tons and tons of these. And there's so much yellow pollen dust blowing around, it sometimes looks like a fog or a mist. It can uh, land in the lakes here and then make like scums of yellow, it almost looks like paint along the edges. So these are pollen cones. These are seed cones. They're both pine cones, pretty weird. So we've now seen that, that, this, and that all counting as pine cones. But you might think like, well, why do they need so many kinds? It turns out pines have a much more complicated life cycle than just, oh, they develop these little things, they make seeds, and then they plant and make new pines. It's actually pretty complicated. It's called alternation of generations. And it happens actually with most plants, like we've talked about with ferns before or mosses and things. Oddly enough, it happens here. So I'll just run through it really quickly and I hope you can practice it and think about it. There are two stages of life that a pine can exist in. One of them is the one you see right here. It's called a sporophyte. There's also a microscopic version of life that a pine can have, and you don't see it. You need a microscope to see it. It's called a gametophyte. If you translate those terms, sporophyte means a plant that reproduces with spores. Gametophyte is a plant that reproduces with gametes, or sperm and eggs. So there's a whole invisible microscopic step of reproduction that's going on in these cones, and that's why there are so many kinds. Step one, you get these little pollen cones forming. Inside here are thousands of little spores that never leave those cones. Each little spore is like about the size of a speck of dust, and inside is a little embryo. They stay in here and they develop into little gametophyte plants. Meanwhile, in here, these future seed cones are making spores too, but these make spores that grow up into another kind of gametophyte. These are female, those are male. So you'd never know that without a microscope or some weird biologist telling you about it because you never see them, you never use them. But the plant uses them, that's how they reproduce. The male gametophytes here make sperm in their little homes in the cones. The female gametophytes in here 
spend their whole life in these little seed cones, they make eggs, sperm and eggs. Guess what happens? The pollen is the male gametophyte with sperm inside it. It blows through the air, lands on here, basically bores a hole or grows a root down into this little cone here and connects with the female gametophytes and fertilizes them. Kind of like a dormitory of guys, a dormitory of gals, late at night or on a windy day, the guys escape and fly around and come in and make babies with the gals. If an egg in here gets fertilized, it's gonna grow into a seed. And if it's fertilized, the seed is developing inside the cone as the cone gets bigger and bigger and bigger till it's eventually like this and then the seeds fall out. So there's a huge hidden story between just having the tree and having a bunch of seeds fall out of it. So I'll repeat it really quickly one more time and then good luck studying it. These little pollen cones make spores that turn into male gametophytes and they make sperm. These little cones have spores that grow into female gametophytes, they make eggs. The pollen leaves here, the little male gametophytes as the pollen, which have sperm in them, blow around in the air, land on here, fertilize the eggs. Now the eggs grow into seeds and the cone gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And when everything's all mature, the cone opens up and the seeds fall out. They fall to the ground and they grow into sporophyte trees again. So here's the sporophyte. The gametophytes are in here. They give rise to new sporophytes and around and around it goes. That's alternation of generations. The hidden magic of pine reproduction. So I've, I've raided the biology lab storage room for some examples of conifer cones to go with us being here outside with a mugo pine here and a white pine overhead. Uh, here on the ground are the crumbly remains of pollen cones where the male gametophytes and pollen were uh, that fell off this mugo pine. They're all here mixed in with an old white pine cone and things. Well, here's a collection of some odds and ends. Here's one from a kind of pine that doesn't live around here. It's called sugar pine. I stole this from a floral arrangement in the administration lounge, so don't tell anybody. But it's uh, pretty dramatic. You wouldn't want that to fall on your head. Um, but here's a white pine cone. So that's definitely a pine cone. What I wanted to show you here is not only the diversity of kinds of cone, from spruce cones and hemlock cones and pine cones and all that kind of stuff. These are all seed cones. If they mature and open up like this, here it's closed up, here they're opening up so the seeds can escape. At the bases of these scales will be one or two little seeds with papery wings. And I wanna show you what some of those look like right here in a dish. I'll get rid of these wood chips. Here's an example right here of a seed that had the papery wing popped off it. There's one of the papery wings. There's a papery wing and a little seed on it. Here's one. These are from different kinds of pine cone that were in this box. So there will be a seed It'll have an embryo in it, a little bit of food supply, starchy endosperm, and all wrapped up. And with this papery wing, it can fly through the air. So if it falls out of a cone, it's gonna spin like this, like a little helicopter and drift off and start a new tree somewhere else. So um, it's kind of like maple seeds, if you've ever seen those. That's what these woody cones are all about, is dropping the seeds. The other kinds of cone, the crumbly pollen cones, have done their job. They've let loose tons and tons of powdery yellow pollen containing sperm. And when they're done, they just drop off and everything now is lying as wreckage on the ground. So here's an example at the Paul Smith College forestry cabin. <laughs> 
an example of one of the main ways people use trees. In addition to have them be a main part of an ecosystem and making oxygen like we showed and things like that, or being a habitat for wildlife, we obviously use them for wood. We grind up the trunks for paper. Um, so I wanna show you some logs that have been cut um, by you know staff, faculty, students in the forestry department probably here, right by the cabin, um, so you can see what's inside a tree trunk and look at how trees grow. So if you look at the trees around here again, like a big white pine over there or those big white pines, any of these here, um, the average person might think they just kind of shoot up from the ground like a rocket and that's how they grow. Um, when we talk about um, what needles are for, we find out that the needles breathe in carbon from the air, combine it with the energy of sunlight and water and minerals from the ground, make sap out of it, and then use that raw material to make wood, leaves, seeds, all the things that are part of the tree. So technically speaking, these logs here are processed air and water. Carbon from the air combined with water will make cellulose, starches, out of the sugars. And um, so here's a big log of starch that we call wood. If you look at how the tree grows, there's evidence of that. Um, the very center of the wood is right there. That was kind of how big the little sapling was in the beginning, you could say, and it added layers outwards as it grew. So instead of pushing up from the ground, these trees grow outwards in their trunk. They grow from the tips of their branches and from the tip of the top. They're almost like fireworks expanding out into the air and growing from the air. So I've got some examples of slices, we call them cookies here, wood cookies taken from tree trunks. Um, just to show you something like this. Each one of these rings is a band of wood that was laid down in a tree that was standing up this way. And it did that during the growing season. So that would be, uh, you know, like late spring, early summer kind of stuff, main part of summer and things like that. It laid down all that carbon rich wood and then stopped growing for the winter. The next spring it laid down another layer and another and another. So if you count these, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, all the way out, you can tell how old the tree was. So these are growth rings or tree rings like that. Uh, different kinds of tree grow at different rates and even the same species will grow differently depending on what its conditions are. So here's another conifer slice right here uh, with much finer growth rings on here. This one wasn't growing as fast maybe as this. Out here they're very compressed, but you could still count those with a hand lens. If you get an extreme example, some of the white cedars around here that grow on the cliffs of the Adirondacks um, have pretty terrible growing conditions. They're on a bluff, let's say, of solid rock. They'll look just like a little bush or something like that. But in fact, a lot of them are ancient adult trees that just haven't been able to grow very much. Kind of like if you've ever heard of bonsai trees, they're kind of like that. Here's a slice from a white cedar in the Cascade Notch. The diameter was just like this. Um, it fell off the cliff eventually, and I sliced off a cookie, polished it, and it's like you can hardly see any growth rings. And that's because they're so small, you need a hand lens or a microscope to see them. There was such little growth in each year that it's incredibly densely packed. And if you actually count these, there's 300 of them in here. This is a 300 year old, old growth white cedar from the cliffs on Cascade Notch. So some of these could just be a few decades old. This is centuries old. You can't always tell from the outside. You'd either have to bore a sample or when it was dead, you could slice it and make a cookie. But if you ever do see a, a down tree and it's got the end cut, maybe someone cut it for a trail. Take a minute and count the rings and see if you've got a nice old growth tree or not. There's another interesting thing here is you notice the streaks on here. Someone might say, oh, look at all that sticky sap, you know, pine sap, but it's not sap, right? It's resin, it's pitch. That's a defense against insects that would bore inside here and eat the wood, rot the wood, make the tree fall over, things like that. So this is, partly chemical defense with terpenes and tannins in there. That's where the word turpentine comes from. 
uh, a toxic substance that you wouldn't want to drink. It's you know distilled from this kind of thing. So it's really abundant, especially in the bark, the needles, the outer part of the wood. There are tubes in here called resin ducts that have the resin in. And if you slice it, the resin oozes out like blood. If you just damage the tree bark, it could seal the wound, just like you can scab over a wound on your own skin. And that protects you know, from fungi getting in and things like that. If an insect were burrowing in there, it tries to chew in, it hits a resin duct, it gets covered with glue and it dies, or its mouth parts get all gummed up and things like that. So this is pitch or resin. There would also be sap in here when the tree was alive. This wood here, all that carbon rich wood, is made of tiny little tubes. So it's as if you took a bunch of drinking straws and you stacked them all together and got a big wad of them and then you turned it sideways like this and you could see the holes going in. This is like microscopic drinking straws. If you stood it up on end and looked at one of these trees, it's basically got drinking straws going down into the roots and right up to the top, pumping water up, keeping it nice and green and fresh. So these tubes or vessels, they're called, have a technical term. Together in here, you call that xylem. It's X-Y-L-E-M, xylem. Um, that is the collection of microscopic tubes made out of starchy wood, cellulose, that make up the bulk of a tree trunk like that. So in there would be a lot of water that came up. Um, there could also be fluids in here and in the inner part of the bark that have a lot of sugar in them that were made in the needles up there. Um, so that would be actual sap which would just be like runny water, it wouldn't be sticky or anything like that, but it would be like the blood of the tree, protected by resin ducts like this. So basically a tree trunk, in addition to being like congealed air, is a lot of tubes all packed tightly together. So because it's got that tube-like structure, you can kind of see a texture to the wood. See like here, you got growth rings sort of visible here, the ends of the growth rings on this. This is a piece of red pine, I guess, yeah. So um, it's got a grain to it. The tubes are running up and down, coming from the roots to the needles and back and forth like that. And if you looked with a microscope, you'd see microscopic tiny little strands in here. In fact, I've almost broken one off, a little piece of one. You see how small that is. It's those little fibrous sizes of things packed in here. So that's why you can split wood into planks and things like that too fairly easily. Or if you burn it for firewood, you can split it. If you go with the grain, because it's a bunch of little tubes lined up this way, it's easier to split them that way than to cut them. You need a saw to do it this way. Here you could use a little hatchet or something. So uh, yeah, let me get a little piece of uh, wood and we'll just show you with a hatchet. So the tubes are running this way, so it's easier to split down among them than to cut across them like that. So I'll just use this uh, hatchet here and just do a little whack this way. Should be able to take off a piece like that pretty easily. Like that. So that was easier than if you go like this I won't hit it very hard because it'll just go flying, but you know, nothing happens when you go that way. You're cutting across the straws and here you're kind of going with them. So you can see it splits that way naturally too. A lot of these wood cookies are splitting along the grain as they dry out too. So there's one other aspect of this that's kind of strange. If a tree is a bunch of straws it starts out with the very central part. Um, sometimes it's called the pith, depending on the kind of tree. It's where even later on, it's just a place where waste gets stored and things like that by the tree. You lay down new layers of wood around it and it just gets wider and wider and wider. But there's a skin around this trunk of wood. It's called the bark. And that skin has to stretch as the trunk gets wider and wider and wider. 
So it's got cracks and things. It's breaking off on the outside, peeling off. Um, so as more wood gets laid down and just stays there, the bark has to expand with it and sort of weather away and replace itself and kind of grow actively. The most amazing thing about this is that's pretty much dead stuff out here. That's mostly dead in here. There's some, you could say, live vessels in here. The most lively part of the whole tree, really, in the trunk at least, is kind of this zone in here. And on this log where it's starting to dry out, you can kind of tell there's a crack right in here. And that's where the bark meets the wood. This is the xylem. This inner part of the bark is another kind of tube that's full of sap and growing cells and things like that. The very inner part is called the phloem, P-H-L-O-E-M, phloem, like flowing, like sap. And in between them, see if I can get a little pointer with my knife here. In between them is a little zone in here, right where the two meet. There's kind of a slimy layer of cells that grow really, really fast. They're fed by the sap that comes out of here and water that's coming up here as well. And they just grow and grow and grow. Some of them turn into little wood vessels and some of them turn into little phloem or inner bark. And it's basically, this is the zone where the growth is happening. New wood is being laid down here. New bark is being laid here, pushing outwards all the time. And that's making the whole trunk get wider and wider. And it's leaving a trail behind it through the years of layers of phloem year by year. And this would be the most recent wood that was just laid down before the tree was cut right in here. So you get xylem, the wood. You get phloem, the inside of the bark. You got the outer dead layer. And this little zone in here where the rapid growth is happening, rapid cell division and things like that, it's called vascular cambium. It basically just means like a, a layer with lots of fluids running through it, basically, which makes sense. It's supplying those growing cells in here. So the vascular cambium makes the new wood and also supplies the new inner part of the bark or the phloem. The water's coming up from the roots in this xylem. The sap is coming down from the needles or coming up in the spring. That's where the sugars are. This is where most of the water is and most of the minerals. And um, there also can be a little mix going on as well. So there you go. Outer bark, inner bark, wood, pith, or the center part. So here's a little review of kind of the anatomy of a conifer. If you have this big old stump here, it's kind of marked up for axes and saws and things like that. This might be a little better. Here's an example of the trunk right here with the bark. If you turn it here, it's been cut. So you can see the growth rings. You might call that heartwood in the middle. This outer part here, you might call sapwood out here. And there can be sap in there, a lot of water going up and down the tree. But most of the real sap is also in the inner part of the bark right here. I'll peel that off. In between this layer of bark, the inner part called phloem and the wood called xylem, in between those was a little mushy layer called vascular cambium where most of the new growth is actually happening. Putting down new layers one by one by one, year by year on the outside of this trunk as it gets bigger and squeezing this outwards so it has to keep growing as well and have new phloem put down on the inside. So heartwood, sapwood, a little pith in the very center and uh, phloem and the outer bark here, vascular cambium there. You can sort of demonstrate it here on a fresh cut white pine branch. Right here, if you peel that back, you can sort of remove the skin of it almost like that. The outside is the outer bark. There's the inner bark here, nice and smooth. And the very innermost surface of that between the wood and the greenish, you could say greenish part of that inner bark is vascular cambium in there. And that's where most of the growth, the slimy parts actually happening. There's the xylem right there. Now it's shiny. So 
Some of that would be actual sap, but most of it is resin or pitch, and that's the chemical and gluey defense against insects or other critters like me trying to destroy it, basically. So it's a great defense. It works for a lot of things, but it's not perfect. If you look at this log here, and it's partly rotted because it's been sitting around for a long time, but there's damage in here. Sometimes insects are adapted to that. There are bark beetles and other kinds of um, beetles that can bore in here in spite of all of that defense somehow and live in that toxic, gluey environment. So um, as we see in general for life on Earth, there are these great adaptations like resin and things like that as a protection. But uh, very often, if there's a resource to exploit, some other species learns how to get around that defense and get in there and do damage. Uh, so it's like an evolutionary arms race going on here with all the fungi and insects trying to eat and make a home in here as well, in spite of all those defenses. So if there's one thing we hope you get out of this lab, well, we hope you get a lot out of it. One of the things is just to see the world around you in a richer way. For a lot of folks that never get to be in a forested setting like this, it's easy to forget that the things we use in our daily lives come from living things and settings just like this. You could go to a hardware store and, you know, or a lumber yard and ask for pieces of wood, you know, for different kinds of things. And you say, oh, wood is this square looking stuff, you know, but it comes from something like this. It's processed air and water and minerals that was developed in a habitat just like this from little structures like this that can harness sunlight and crystallize carbon from the air and mix it with water and minerals from the soil and stuff like that. So a uh, pretty interesting thing. And of course, if you grind this up in the right way, you make the paper, the little fibers of the paper that we do a lot of our work on. So we're using the bodies of trees to do a lot of what we do. We're hoping that you'll learn that uh, not only is a tree made of wood and kind of how it works, but also that there are many kinds of tree. We're focusing here on the conifers that have leaves, just like other trees, only the leaves are in a needle shape. Uh, we talked about how they reproduce with cones, like seed cones like this, and the pollen cones, which you can almost kind of see a few of on here with alternation of generations. Uh, we were talking about how there are different species of conifers, like white pine here and red pine here, and how to identify those. Um, these are some of the oldest kind of tree on the planet. If you look around the woods right here, there are lots of different kinds of plant. You got grasses and maples and birches and things like that. Um, those are flowering plants that evolved relatively recently in the history of life. But the conifers were here long before that. If you can travel back in time in your mind to this landscape, let's say 200 million years ago, there would still have been a forest here, but most of the trees would have been conifers. Uh, we would have had dinosaurs running around here in the woods among the ancestors of these, long before a lot of these other kinds of plants were even here. So it's also a big part of more recent history. The native folks who've come here for thousands of years to live in the uplands um, they use, you know, the wood to make their own shelters with, and um, you can make a nutritious drink from the needles that's full of vitamin C. It's called conifer needle tea, and uh, indigenous folks figured this out and then taught uh, Euro-American settlers how to do it as well, and they could fight scurvy and nutritional diseases. All you do is you can take pretty much any of these and uh, just boil up a little pot of water if you got a campfire or a camp stove and stuff them in there as many needles as it can hold and just let it boil for a minute or two. You pour off the liquid and sweeten it if you like sweetener and you have a no cost, high vitamin C, fragrant smelling tea. So um, lumberjacks used to use it as well for a little bit of refreshment. So if you wanna really uh, introduce yourself to Adirondack culture that dates back centuries, make yourself a little pot of conifer needle tea and enjoy your time in the Adirondacks.